Hello, thanks for joining me. So today I'd like to do a getting started video for tabletop wargaming. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I got started and um, just give you an overview of the kind of things that you're going to need if you are interested in starting on this hobby. Um, the inspiration for this video came from comments on my last video. I just started this channel to talk a little bit more about my wargaming hobby specifically and um, the comments tended to be um, sort of questions about getting started uh, or just kind of comments about you know whether people had started or not and I realized that this kind of video would probably be useful so uh, I hope that you enjoy. Um, for starters the hobby is pretty vast I would say in the um, kinds of um, skills and uh, activities that you're going to be, uh, you know, utilizing and participating in, um, and I feel like people gravitate towards uh, one or more of those aspects of the hob hobby over others. But you know, that's not really to the exclusion of any of them. Um, I feel like you're going to be doing a wide variety of uh, crafting and and gaming uh, activities. So. If you're thinking about, uh, you know, hey, is this something that would be fun for me? You're going to want to kind of dip a toe in, right? Um, and just see what you think. Uh, the way that I got started was because of a friend. So I would say one thing that is optional, but um, probably really useful, is having a buddy who's interested in maybe playing a game with you, right? Um, do you like board games? Do you like tabletop games? Do you like the idea of like a fantasy, historical, or science fiction game? Then, um, you know, you, you want to try one of these games out. Um, my buddy and I, uh, way back when, uh, started with a game called Space Hulk. Now, I don't have a uh, copy of the original Space Hulk, but this is, I believe, our original copy of Gene Stealer, which is an expansion to that game. Um, what's really nice about these boxed sets, not maybe this in particular, but the, the base game that it's based on, is uh, they come with everything you need. So, um, you know, it's really nice to be able to just pick up a set, and you've got typically two, you know, forces of... Um, of models, right, and the rules, and maybe uh, board sections and things like that. Uh, dice are usually going to come in it, um, so you, you pretty much can just play right out of the box. Um, a good thing to remember is that you don't need to paint uh, your miniatures. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but like if you just want to get started and you want to see what a game is like, if the gaming aspect of it is something that um, you know, you want to you want to see what you think of the particular game that you've picked up. Um, you can go ahead and uh, put your models together uh, and try the game out and see what you think. Back in 1989, when my buddy and I got Space Hulk, it was uh, I believe um, retailed for about a hundred bucks. Uh, another thing that's nice about doing this with a friend is you can split the cost. The main thing you're going to be splitting are the models. So, uh, for instance, like Death Watch Overkill uh, came with Space Marine models, it came with Gene Stealer models, uh, same with uh, Space Hulk, and, um, you know, it cuts the cost. So, you know, in 1989, uh, 100 bucks um, was, you know, kind of more than it is now, right? And things are more expensive now, but they're still not prohibitively expensive. Uh, this set here, Death Watch Overkill, I believe I got for something like 180 bucks, some, somewhere around in there. You know, it might just sort of retailed for $200, right? So for somewhere between 90 and 100 bucks each, um, if you split this with a friend, uh, you guys are going to be able to get, you know, the whole game system and a bunch of models. Uh, I understand that not everyone you know, necessarily has money like that to spend on their hobby. But, um, you know, for something like this, I think that that's really pretty reasonable. We got that Space Hulk game when we were literally in junior high school, right? I had 50 bucks I could scrounge up at that time from, you know, whatever, an allowance, uh, mowing lawns, you know, <laughs> whatever it was, and uh, we were able to go have these on, uh, on Space Hulk. So, um, you know, this it's totally uh, a doable thing, and uh, we've had fun with it for decades, right? Now, boxed games are not the only way to go. 
Um, most of these games, you know, are game systems, and there are different ways to play. So, um, for instance, Space Hulk and uh, Death Watch Overkill, um, they're all based in those particular games in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, which is a science fiction universe, um, you know, by, by Games Workshop. And um, so they, they do have other ways of playing. Um, you have, you know, a also just kind of like a big army style game, which is just Warhammer 40,000. Um, they do sell box sets for that, so you can get started with a Warhammer 40,000 um, kind of proper, I would say, or vanilla, um, by getting a box set, which is definitely a good way to start. But I tend to like, um, you know, the skirmish games and things like that, um, just because I think that the the pressure, you know, certainly to uh, buy a whole lot of models is not really there. Um, but, uh, you know, Warhammer 40k seems like a really cool game system. Um, something my buddy and I are playing is uh, is Kill Team. So here you can see this is just the core manual rule book. Um, so let's say you, you picked up this book, you're um, basically going to get also everything you need to play, aside from, you know, things like dice and models. Those are the things that are going to be included in, for instance, a box set. Uh, and there is a, uh, there are several, I believe, um, full uh, box sets for Kill Team to get you started. But let's say you already had some uh, miniatures, or you just wanted to you know, not get one of those box sets and do your own thing, um, you could get this core manual. Uh, you're going to be able to um, basically have all the core rules, and um, then you have, uh, you know, missions that you can play. So there's, uh, you know, uh, nar narrative play, uh, you know, match play, and then um, you basically have the the data sheets, I guess they would call them in this, in this game, um, for all of the kill teams. For instance, I just uh, picked up some Necron models, so if I go to the Necron page 150, we have some, uh, some tactics that are specific to these units, uh, which we can use uh, in addition to, um, uh, like, sort of global uh, tactics. Uh, and then we have, um, the models that we can use, Necron Warriors, Immortals, Flayed Ones, and Deathmark. Now that is it for this core uh, edition of Kill Team. Now, uh, my buddy and I, um, my buddy picked up Pariah Nexus, and uh, just like we did when we were in junior high school, right, um, I offered to basically split the models with him and go ahead and buy his Necron Warriors, or uh, basically the Necron models that came with Pariah Nexus. Um, so I believe I got Flayed Ones, uh, Chronomancer, um, and I'm also getting a few other uh, models from him. Uh, so what's nice about that is this is also a uh, kill team, and it includes um, some new... It includes rules, basically, for those particular models. Uh, more tactics, actually, that you could use if you want. Uh, and you know, we have rule, uh, you know, data sheets here for Overlord, Plasmancer, Psychomancer, Chronomancer, Royal Warden, Technomancer, and then the original, uh, you know, models that came uh, with that original Kill Team set. So, you know, that's another thing I think that can be fun. And it was it's a little off-putting to me at first, where I'm like, oh man, am I like, like I'm, why is this so complicated? Like, I'm, am I missing rules or something like that? You really aren't. For instance, um, let's say you have this core manual. Uh, and you buy uh, a pre-built kill team set um, instead of just picking, you know, whatever some models that you want that are in the book and that you want to play with your uh, with your game. Um, you know, picking this up. These are specific models uh, and um, you know some extra rules and data sheets um, for this group of gene stealer cultists. You have um, a set of acolytes uh, and or. Uh, metamorphs, I believe. I don't know if there's rules in here for the metamorphs in Kill Team. Uh, I just don't remember. Uh, you also get this really cool kind of uh, specialist, I don't know, command sort of unit here, the Keller Morph. And um, yeah, you know, you get uh, extra tactics cards. Um, you get, uh, you know, commander tactics cards. I guess that's what he is in Kill Team as a commander. So this is, does not have everything you need to play the game. But if you had that rule book and you and you bought your Kill Team like this, you're going to get 
like additional uh, rules, you're going to get models for your kill team, and you've got everything that you need to, to play with your buddy as long as they also get their own boxed kill team or, you know, just pick some, uh, some models out of the book. Now everything we've talked about so far are Games Workshop games. Um, games Workshop is one of the core kind of premier fantasy and science fiction tabletop miniature um, game systems, right? That is not the only game in town. Uh, in fact, there are lots and lots of games. In my instance, I'm a huge Resident Evil fan. So this was uh, kickstarted a while ago, uh, this Resident Evil 2, the board game. It's a miniatures game, uh, has its own rules, it has its own minis. Uh, comes with everything that you need here in this box. Uh, I don't remember exactly how much this was. It's super uh, fun. Uh, another game here that really caught my fancy is a Descent Journeys in the Dark uh, with a hair on it. Uh, this is the second edition. Again, this was, um, you know, it's it's a, a chunk of change, right? But you're also getting in here everything that you need to play. This is a little bit Dungeons and Dragons-esque, right? Except uh, I feel like the, the, the burden, so to speak, of um, like role-playing your character in a really narrative fashion is pretty much lifted and you're focusing more on the mechanics of, you know, playing a tabletop game, which was really attractive to me. You have one person who's pretty much acting as a dungeon master, right? And then you have, uh, I think, up to four other players who are playing as uh, adventurers. So you're going to want at least two people to play this game. Uh, Resident Evil 2, interestingly enough, you can play by yourself if you would like. Um, there are, it's basically all of the uh, enemy actions are rule-based, so you basically just follow the rules for how the enemies behave, and then um, then you, you know, you play with your hero characters. Uh, in this, you know, somebody does play the, the dungeon, more or less, right? All of the monsters and the traps and things like that. Uh, and you have a, a book that does have fun storytelling to it, right? So you get to read the book. It's a little bit more about um, actually fighting your way through the dungeon in a, in a tactical sense. And I really love this. But the, the point is, if there's a gameplay style that you think you'd like, there's a setting that you think you'd like. Um, chances are there's a tabletop miniature game out there for you. Um, and that's one of the things I think makes this hobby really exciting. So in addition to the gaming aspect of the hobby, there is what I would call the hobby part of the hobby, right? And that is everything else. Um, pr pretty much like the, the, the making, painting, um, collecting uh, of of models of figurines um, you know we used to call these miniatures uh, specifically metal miniatures because they were metal um, as the years have gone by uh, there have been uh, you know sets of plastic that have been introduced and uh, people these days tend to call them models um, you will see here uh, I have a sprue uh, of some you know more uh, modern miniatures and um, they're, they're literally like models. Uh, I actually feel like this aspect of the hobby currently um, feels quite a bit different than it did um, back in like 1989, 1990 when I first started for, for certain um, because you're going to be you know cutting different parts off of sprues and uh, assembling these miniatures uh, you're going to have to be cleaning up mold lines and things like that um, and really the assembly and prep of these uh, is more involved than it used to be. Models that I have here uh, I specifically chose because they're not necessarily part of a gaming system that I'm interested in in playing. I mean to some extent perhaps but uh, these orcs in particular uh, I got back in the day when my buddy and I had first started playing um, Space Hulk just because I liked them. I just liked the looks of them. Um, you know, orcs are kind of fun and, uh, you know, goofy and, um, you know, big and smashy. And uh, I just thought that they were, they were neat. Uh, they were, they were fun and I enjoyed the uh, prospect of painting them. And I painted some of them just for the enjoyment of it. Um, and that's uh, another way you could approach the entire hobby if you were so interested. Um, it's definitely a bit of a, an artistic and creative outlet, and uh, if that's 
the part of it that attracts you the most. You don't even need to get a gaming system um, to go along with your miniatures. You could just get some miniatures and paint them. Um, this here is not even uh, a you know Warhammer set of figurines. These come from um, Raging Heroes. Uh, I really like the look of their models. I have not put any together or painted them yet, so this is just my first dipping a toe into uh, Raging Heroes. I've gotten the Furians. Uh, this is All-Stars Command of their Blood Tribes. Now, one thing I've noticed that Raging Heroes tends to do is not exclusively, but they seem to offer alternative models to some of the models that exist in the Warhammer um, line. And specifically what I've noticed is uh, Warhammer models tend to be extremely monogender, right? Um, there are very, very few female models in the, in the line to the point where it almost feels unnatural. Uh, my buddy and I are interested in playing War Cry, um, so in addition to these seeming like they would be fun to paint, um, they also would be some great replacement models to, um, you know, models that uh, you can play in War Cry. Um, you know, of course, I would not be able to play these in an official tournament, let's say. Um, I might, um, you know, out of respect, not necessarily take them to a game store that sells um, Games Workshop stuff and play them in my Games Workshop game that I'm playing there, for instance. But as long as my buddy agrees that, um, you know, that these are uh, adequate stand-ins for models that I would be using in Warcry, uh, you know, there's no reason that I can't use them in my Warcry band. And even if I didn't do that, I just think they're really cool. So I'm going to enjoy painting them. Um, and that's one of the things that I think you can uh, absolutely just pick the coolest uh, models that spark your imagination and just give you that inspiration to paint. And man, just paint your models. Uh, it's super fun. One of the um, necessities of the hobby uh, aspect of this are some glues. Um, specifically when I was um, you know, working with metal miniatures exclusively back in the day, um, we, we used super glue. Um, super glue is pretty much what you're going to want to be using for metal miniatures. You technically could use for your plastic models if you wanted to as well. Uh, it's definitely something you're going to want to have around um, because of its versatility. Um, in addition, because most of the models now are plastic and most of them are polystyrene, um, you are going to be able to use these types of plastic cement. Um, I have this Plastruct plastic weld, which is something that I just got. I haven't really had a chance to um, try it. We also have this Testers cement for plastic models. Um, these work as, I believe, a solvent that pretty much um, dissolves uh, the plastic and um, because of that, the two parts of plastic that you've put together fuse together, and it makes it an extremely strong bond for um, those plastic parts. Um, and I did forget to mention, actually, um, you know, plastic is not the only, uh, and I guess polystyrene plastic is not the only material that you're necessarily going to be running into. Um, additionally, resin is used uh, occasionally, or maybe even like more and more these days, uh, and super glue is also going to be your go-to for that. Um, these two types uh, brands, I guess maybe more, of super glue I purchased at the grocery store, so uh, this is not hard to get. I believe they cost somewhere between, you know, three and five dollars each, so, um, you know, not a, a significant um, monetary expenditure, but, you know, keep in mind, um, you're going to want to uh, set aside a few bucks to buy some glue if you don't have it. Um, something like this, uh, Elmer's Glue Wall, uh, this is also called PVA, I believe, by a lot of hobbyists. Um, you know, this is not something you're going to be using to, uh, to glue your miniatures together, right? Uh, this will not work, but uh, it's actually very useful for uh, what you'd call basing, where you're um, uh, applying some glue to your base and then you're adding basing materials. Uh, those materials uh, maybe we'll talk about in just a moment. In addition to glues, we also have paints. Now, um, you know, with 
most aspects of this hobby really the sky is the limit right um, but I don't want to intimidate you guys with you know the fact that I have this little um, you know stand for all the paints and the quantity of paints that I have and things like that um, you know really when I started with this um, I mean you do want also want a surface I suppose to be um, you know assembling and painting your miniatures at but um, I started off with a drafting table that I had already had that I used for drawing and I used for um, you know doing my homework and things like that it was basically my desk so if you guys have a desk or even a kitchen table or any of those things you pretty much have the space that you need to do your modeling uh, you may want like a, a nice mat you know cutting mat or something like that um, just to put down for cleanliness and also because you know it's it's decent for cutting so you're not going to like you know mar the the surfaces that you're working on um, but uh, but yeah you know you're going to be able to um, you know find a space to do your hobbying um, especially when you're first starting out. <laughs> I don't think that you need to worry about that too much. Uh, in terms of paints, when I started, I uh, believe that I picked up um, Citadel's, like, Citadel Color um, paint sets, just one of their basic paint sets. You can see here, uh, Citadel Color. This is, um, like, Games Workshop brand of, uh, of paints. And this, I think, is what a lot of people are going to associate with sort of their older style of paints, but I believe... Um, these might be uh, even even older. Uh, if not, they're at least the original paints that I got in that set. And you can see, um, you know, I have I have several of the colors still. Uh, they they have held up to this day. It's what like 30 years later, and um, and you know they're uh, yeah they still work and um, and they're pretty good. Um, so, but, you know, basically you, you can get a set of paints, and I would say, I think that set that I got was probably around $20 back then. You're going to want to probably set aside at least a good 30 40 bucks, uh, maybe even a little more, uh, depending on what you want to do. But I would just get, like, a basic set. You don't want to be using your paints directly out of the pot. Uh, it's nice to put them on a palette, and it's nice to um, thin them down somewhat. So another thing you might want to consider is uh, some type of palette. Uh, you can see I have here some of these like you know, little plastic artist palettes that you might have used in school. Um, you might be able to get them at just you know any sort of like a crafts store or something like that. And I actually like these pretty well. If you want to get a little fancier, I do have this wet palette. Um, this is something that I also got at a craft store, so you know you don't have to go uh, specifically to some sort of tabletop, you know, gaming hobby store to get these things. And um, you know this is a, a way definitely to kind of step up your painting game. But you know I feel like I've had a fair amount of experience painting at this point. Maybe you know not as much as as some other people or that I could have, but um, I'm still getting warming up to this I, I would say I think that this is a good idea for me but um, but definitely do not feel pressured to um, start off with like a wet palette or anything like that um, you really don't even necessarily technically need to get something like this just use something as a palette this is really just plastic so like if you had like the back of a plastic container or something like that that's your palette put your paints on that you can add a little bit of water or um, airbrush thinner is what I tend to use these days for um, most of my thinning um, because I feel like it um, kind of because it's made for airbrushes it, what it's made for is to um, you know thin the paint so that they um, go through the airbrush smoothly and they don't clog it up and um, you know I just feel like it makes kind of a smoother paint really uh, to apply to your your miniatures um, but again, um, you know, don't get too caught up in the details. You have some paints, um, you have, you know, just, you can use something as a palette, you can add water to it to thin it down, and, uh, and you're doing, you're doing pretty well there. Um, here you can see a set of brushes that I got, uh, on Amazon for, you know, pretty cheaply. Um, this, you know, you can get a set of something like this for 10 to 15 bucks, you know, maybe 20 bucks if you want to splurge. Um, but these are, you know, these are nice. I'm not actually 100% sure if these are synthetic or, um, like, you know, hair, uh, sable brushes. But, um, 
but these are these are pretty nice, right? A set of uh, all very small uh, miniature brushes. Uh, you can see, well, I guess you can't see anymore, but uh, I have a bunch of them from back in the day. Um, really, you don't need a set of brushes even like this. Um, you can use a single brush, and you're probably doing pretty well. Um, a lot of hobbyists buy you know, what they call cheap synthetic brushes, um, which, you know, I don't necessarily think you need to do. Uh, I would I would really rather buy like maybe one or two nice uh, brushes and just keep them in good shape. Uh, I guess I forgot to point out as well, um, you know, in your paints, so you don't necessarily want just paints. Um, that's going to be fine for getting started if you want. Um, I also got this set of inks. Um, it's going to give you a little more versatility in terms of washes and things like that, and we'll get into some uh, painting techniques probably in like a getting started painting video. Um, but uh, you know, suffice to say, um, there there's 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 not just one type of paint. <laughs> so um, you are going to want paints. Uh, you're going to want primers. This is a brush-on primer. Um, we also have things like this, which are, um, you know, spray can primers. And honestly, when I, when I looked at this, I sort of, I wasn't really sure exactly what kind of primer this is, and this is actually an enamel primer. And technically, it doesn't say that it's for plastic, it says it's for wood metal and more, quote-unquote, but plastic is never stated on here. Um, do your own research, I guess. If you're really, you know, concerned about it, you can always buy... Uh, primers that are branded specifically for, um, you know, wargaming hobby. Uh, you've got things like Army Painter, I think, probably has their own primers. Um, you can see this is uh, Viejo's, uh, you know, brush-on primer. Um, you're going to have Games Workshop's own, like, spray can primers and things like that. Um, this uh, Krylon uh, primer here that I have um, does say it specifically it is for, you know, plastics and... Uh, etc etc so I've used this before but really I do not I don't feel like I've ever had any problem just getting like a can of spray paint at the hardware store <laughs> right um, no matter what it says that the primer is for I believe I primed you know some of the miniatures in my case with this primer and I think it's just fine Um, there are some physical tools that I would say are just necessary, and there are some that are nice. Um, so here I have a pair of clippers um, for modern miniature wargaming. You're going to want a pair of these to clip your uh, model pieces off of the sprues uh, in a pinch, or, I mean, I guess if you really didn't want to do that, um, a hobby knife is going to be something you can also use to separate um, those pieces from the sprues. A uh, hobby knife is also just really helpful and useful in general for, um, you know, trimming, cutting, uh, removing mold lines, things like that. They do uh, make tools that are specifically for, um, you know, kind of scraping mold lines off of, um, of miniatures, of models, so that you don't actually need to use a hobby knife, right? Um, but, you know, this is just something that I've had in my repertoire uh, since I first started and I found it useful. Uh, tweezers. Uh, might be a thing that you would find handy. Um, you know, you're going to want a cup. Here I have like a fancy, uh, you know, Citadel branded, <laughs> um, you know, water pot that has little uh, channels here for shape reshaping your, your brush uh, after each time you um, rinse it off. But uh, just get a mug, you know, an old mug. Uh, I actually have an old mug, um, you know, just on the other table that I've literally used for years and uh, it's full of paint gunk um, because that is something that you will want to have. Basing materials. Now this is another thing where you know you can go crazy <laughs> um, but you also really don't have to. Um, this is just kind of another example of how, where there's a whole range of uh, you know, how much you get into certain aspects of, uh, of you know, your miniatures. Um, and, uh, certainly another aspect of this is, um, you know, terrain and, and scenery. Um, you can get really deep into crafting your own uh, scenery for your tabletop, um, just to make your, 
your games more fun. You can uh, buy terrain, uh, some of which is like made specifically for the game that you're playing. Uh, they may even have um, additional rules associated with the terrain itself. Um, but, you know, basically each of your models, uh, when you get them, are going to come with a base uh, of some sort. And that base is, um, you know, something that you're going to glue the model down to. And, um, you know, you may want to decorate that base. Uh, you really don't have to. If you'd like to, you can paint it. Um, you could paint it a color. Um, you could just leave it black plastic if you'd like but um you know this again the sky is the limit um some people make really elaborate interesting bases uh i myself uh even on my old channel had um done a little you know just sort of tutorial so to speak but uh, i'd made some uh some bases specifically in a style similar to the board sections of death watch overkill uh for my models but came with death watch overkill <laughs> um they are um some resin bases that I bought from this company, uh, these sci-fi bases here, um, I thought that, you know, just fit really well with that, um, aesthetic, and, you know, you, if you'd like to, you can buy your own, um, kind of sculpted, uh, bases. Now, because these are resin, you're going to need to super glue to them, uh, and when you're super gluing, especially if you're doing metal miniatures, but even plastic miniatures, sometimes you'd like to pin your stuff. So I have this little hand drill. Uh, this is something that you could get if you wanted. Uh, you could use a Dremel. Uh, there are different options. But, um, you know, basically you could use a little piece of paper clip. You're going to clip that off. Uh, you're going to drill a hole and you're going to um, basically have part of the little piece of paper clip sticking into your model, part of it sticking into the base, and then you're going to glue it that way. It just gives it a little bit more support so it's not going to be coming off of a base uh, like this as easily. Um, you also have these various basing materials. Um, this is where something like this, uh, this glue all uh, comes in really handy. Um, and you also have things like mm, these texture paints. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a little while since I picked these up, um, this Agrellan Earth and Astro Granite are um, specifically texture, you know, paints, so to speak. They're not really paints. They're, um, it's, it's texture, I don't know, medium that you uh, could use to put on your base to give it some texture. You're going to want to make these things look like they're dirt and rocks and grass and the things that you're... Uh, your models might be uh, walking on. You can see here I have a range of different sized rocks. Um, I picked these up probably when I was in uh, junior high school in my um, you know, front yard, in the driveway, things like that. I have some um, you know small p pieces of slate here that I collected. I have different grains of sand and uh, and stones here that I collected. Um, this one in the middle here is actually something I bought. I believe it's sand for like fish tanks and things like that. Um, and what I liked about that is it's clean and it's pretty uniform. Um, so you know you can just, you can go buy something like that. Uh, there's flocking material here that I picked up. Um, you know green static grass it is called. Um, you also have these I don't know tufts right. Um, so I have a couple of different kinds of sort of dead grasses here. And, um, yeah, you know, this is, I think, um, definitely something that I've been wanting to improve on, I think. I, if you see my bases, I, I would say most of them are pretty basic. Uh, especially, like, you know, these here, uh, I think are a good example of, you know, back in the day, so to speak, um, you know, uh, the, the typical method was you put some glue down, you drop some sand on it, and then you paint it like it's grass, right? And I think that that is a great fallback um, for any miniature that you want to look like they're standing on grass. Um, but really, you can get very creative with your bases. And, um, you know, I would try not to be intimidated by this kind of thing. Um, have fun right? Do what you like, and, um, you know, you can make some, some really cool looking uh, miniatures without even that much effort. So yeah, we've talked about gaming, we've talked about the hobby, uh, which I would say includes, you know, painting, um, we've talked about some tools that you'd want for assembling your miniatures, um, glues, paints, um, 
you know, some things like primers and inks, uh, things like that. Um, we've talked about basing uh, and different basing materials. Um, you know, and I, I think that gives you guys a pretty good overview of, you know, some of the things that you would need and, um, you know, how you might want to approach getting into this hobby. Um, it's, you know, not anything that anybody needs to do, right? But if this seems exciting to you, uh, if you're um, inspired by the prospect of painting your own miniatures or playing some of these games, then I would say definitely, you know, give it a shot. Uh, I think, you know, I've shown here some, some various ways that you could uh, approach this with, you know, buying your own models and a book uh, of rules, um, you know, going with a, a uh, Warhammer uh, system or universe like Warhammer Age of Sigmar or Warhammer 40,000, uh, or, you know, other myriad um, game systems, myriad miniature manufacturers. You know, you can even 3D print your own miniatures, right? Um, that's something that's relatively new, but I was really surprised to see that 3D printers for, like, printing resin minis are quite affordable now. Um, you can get printers for like $200 and less. The hobby is really exciting right now. So, uh, you know, I'm going to have more videos about my painting, uh, and I'd like to give you like a little bit of a painting tutorial, sort of like the basic basics that I learned back in like 1990, right? I really want to share that with you guys. So hope this has been fun, and I hope that you'll join me again for more, um, uh, you know, tabletop miniature uh, wargaming videos. Take care, guys.